Well, in general, I've been focused on trying to develop brain imaging techniques to be used in clinical populations. So I work with a lot of different clinical populations, Alzheimer's, um, autism, but also ADHD and dyslexia and uh, a lot of brain tumor patients and epilepsy. So the idea is not so much to focus on a particular disorder, but to focus on um, trying to learn how to make techniques appropriate for doing clinical evaluations, um, uh, both from a basic research perspective and also in ways that will, will help patients. Um, it was one of those things that I accidentally happened upon. Mm -hmm. um, I was an epilepsy specialist and was doing neuropsychology of epilepsy at the NIH. And I just happened to be there when they had a PET scanner at the time before there was fMRI. Mm -hmm. um, and they had one of the few, they were one of the few places that had the capability of doing water PET, so activation PET studies. And, and I was working with epilepsy, so we had thought that we would try to use PET to do pre-surgical planning okay. um, and map language in, in patients with epilepsy. And then I just happened to be there when fMRI was invented. And we had a good MRI scanner where we could do um, very primitive <laughs> but effective fMRI evaluations. And that was it. I was hooked after that. went to do my internship and I did my, my internship at Yale and stayed on there for a couple of years and then um, I, and I specialized in epilepsy, in the neuropsychology of epilepsy there mm -hmm. and then I, I um, applied for a postdoc at uh, the Epilepsy Center at the NIH and so that's where I did my postdoctoral training. So I was there for about four years and then came here to UCLA where I've been ever since. In terms of the things that I think um, really influenced my career early on um, was the complexity of um, systems that we had previously thought to be simple, uh, systems that we understood based on uh, watching patients get strokes. Uh, mm -hmm. So our whole window into the brain before functional imaging was waiting for somebody to get a stroke in one place figure out where that place was, figure out what the person couldn't do, and then deduce what that brain area should do based on what the person couldn't do. And it's a very roundabout way of trying to understand the brain. I was in particular interested in uh, language and memory, but initially in language, uh, which we thought we could use functional imaging very, very easily to find the, the two language areas that everybody knew about, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Mm -hmm. um, and so we started doing PET studies and very, very quickly realized that the language system was way more um, complicated than we had ever imagined. And, um, and it, it was daunting at first because we thought, oh, well, this is great. We're going to do a quick language study. We'll figure out where the language areas are. We'll be able to operate on somebody's brain and know that they'll be safe. And it, it, as soon as we did our first scans, we realized we have to go back to square one and, and erase all of our understanding of what we thought the language system was mm -hmm. and start all over. So to me, just going through that process and uh, seeing how much functional imaging, first PET, but then fMRI, could reveal about the complexity of, in my case, language uh, organization in the brain, um, just how much more complex it was than we ever thought about um, how highly detailed um, the brain was in, in its um, ability to process very specific aspects of information. The concept of the social brain, and we, we have a, a model of the social brain and all the different brain regions and systems that are involved in social processing, that was something that we didn't even imagine um, uh, 25 years ago when I first started out uh, in this field. We, we, there, there weren't lesions that caused, uh, that caused social uh, impairment, in, mm -hmm. at least not in, not in the way that we see it now, in the sophisticated way that we see it now. Even from a systems perspective, I think before we had an idea that, well, maybe there's a lot of stuff we don't know at this molecular level and at the cellular level, but certainly we know what the brain systems are, and we didn't. Um, I think that I would say, and most people would say, that my greatest uh, scientific achievement was um, the, uh, the first paper that we did looking at a common polymorphism uh, risk gene um, in a normal population and showing that, um, that normal volunteers who differed in their possession of a, of a risk gene um, uh, had different brain activation patterns and uh, that ultimately developed into the field of imaging genetics. Mm -hmm. So I think that that um, initial foray into the, that um, whole way of, of examining the brain 
integrating imaging genetics together was my biggest accomplishment. I, I, I still think that it is, even though that was a long time ago. When I was um, at Yale doing my internship, I was pregnant and uh, I was in the neurosurgery department and I was the only female in the neurosurgery department. There are 50 men and me and I was pregnant and they thought I was from Mars. <laughs> and back then it was legal for, um, for people to fire you for being pregnant. My internship advisor uh, told me when I went into work every day how wrong he thought it was for women to have careers and be pregnant um, and, and to have children. And he said, do one or the other, but you shouldn't do both. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was, of course, now it would be illegal. He could lose his job for saying that, but back then it was, that was typical. So I think that back in the old days it was much more overt and we had no legal protections. Um, and I think proportionally there are more women in science now than there used to be. But um, I'm um, sadly impressed with how many barriers there still are, um, mostly in the unconscious biases that both men and women have, but particularly men in reviewing papers and reviewing grants. Um, uh, in salaries, we were just calculating the salary differential here, um, even at UCLA, and it's the same as, as it is in any hmm. um, blue-collar profession. There's no difference. Uh, uh, in psychology, it's no different than it is in, in physics or any place else. Uh, I thought it was awesome. Yeah. I was nervous a lot of the time because I gave a keynote this year, so I spent the first couple of days obsessing over my, <laughs> my slides. Um, but um, I thought it was terrific. I think that the meetings are getting better, uh, honestly. I mm -hmm. think the science is getting better, the technology is getting better. Uh, there have been a few years where I wasn't so sure, but I, I really feel like the last few years and uh, the science has been amazing. The other talks there were just incredible. I, I love OHBM. I think that the main things that um, I try to do, particularly at OHBM, is to be apprised of the newest techniques in acquisition and in analysis. And I, I don't even know that I could point to one because there are just so many things. Mm -hmm. I would say, if I could say one thing, it would be uh, graph theory. Um, you know, looking at Bill Seeley when you know, he gave his keynote last year. Um, we'd been doing graph, year, graph theory for a couple of years, but um, to find new ways of conceptualizing connections and connectivity in the brain, to me, is just a, 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 has been... It was a major change in the direction of imaging when that started to become more um, popular. And, of course, we always knew that the connectivity was important, even early mm -hmm. on when we were just doing um, you know, regional activation studies. But we didn't know how uh, to measure it. Um, in fact, back in the old days, even in PET, um, uh, Barry Horowitz was looking at connectivity. Um, what he would do is draw a region of interest around every region in the brain and just put together a gigantic correlation oh, matrix uh -huh. of, of um, pet activity. And, uh, you know, back then, it, we didn't have the math even to reduce the data into something meaningfully, but uh, meaningful, but, um, but at least there was some general idea about l looking at how different regions were connected, how activity, or in that case, it was, we were still back in glucose metabolism correlated in different areas of the brain, was of interest, but we didn't have the techniques. And so watching those techniques develop and seeing them at OHVM in particular has been really exciting. And I've been very happy to be importing that and looking at connectivity. And now uh, most of our work, I would say, focuses on connectivity, including the new human connectome um, studies right. that we're working on now. Yeah, yeah. What do you think is the best piece of scientific advice that someone has given you? Um, gosh. Um, I don't know if it, I would call this scientific advice. It's more like personal advice. But very early in my career, when I was writing my very first papers and feeling terribly anxious about doing it and thinking, oh, my God, you know, this is going to be so criticized. What, how am I going to be able to be productive? I think it's a particularly a problem for women who aren't raised with natural self-confidence. Um, and so I contacted a friend of mine who would, had been publishing, and I said, how do you do it? How do you get over that, that um, barrier of being so self-conscious about your work that mm -hmm. you can write freely? And she said, well, I sent my papers out to the scariest people I knew uh, before I set them out for publication. And I figured if I could take the criticism from, from the people who were like big names in the field who scare the crap out of me, then I'd be okay. 
And so that's what I did. I sent one of my first papers to Peter Fox, who was the head of the, um, he, this was before he went to San Antonio. Um, and, uh, and he responded and read it and made comments, and it was, it was fabulous. So that was, I guess it's kind of scientific advice. Yeah. Uh, how to become a productive scientist is, is an important um, uh, question. So um, that helped me tremendously. And now I don't worry at all. <laughs>